Welcome, welcome to the school district. Um, glad to be here and beginning to talk about a very important um, bit of information for us. Want to point out a couple of people in the room. Um, again, as the superintendent today, my job is to educate you around this bond. Um, during my day job, I can't advocate for it. Um, Howard is leading our political action committee, and that is kind of their job to get out and start to advocate for it. So I want to just um, say my appreciation again, having somebody with that kind of energy helping to um, get the word out is really important to me. So round of applause for Howard. Sorry, it's a little awkward seat. <laughs> Um, also, just want to point out David Warner is my uh, head of communications here and kind of helping. This is actually the we've given some some education speeches already this year around this, but it's kind of this is the new one that we're floating out that we'll be taking out to the public. So you're kind of my my intro shot here. Um, this year we've uh, it's been a long process. We've actually my job here today is to kind of ensure you have accurate information around the bond to answer some questions that you have and then kind of give you some, Howard will step up to give you some next steps. This has been a long process. It actually started actually before I got here. Um, so in 2017, they started into a process called the Long Range Facility Planning Process. It's actually a hundred year plan. And so it looks at how do we make sure that the school district buildings here in our um, have a plan over a hundred years because eventually these buildings wear out and the, as a community, we have to provide new um, spaces. And so we go into a very long process determining exactly when and where buildings we think are gonna um, go out of age. So the first thing that happens is we go through and we look at um, the, we look at total deferred maintenance, which is again, um, I was talking to Mark earlier, and um, in a school district, we have a thing called the general fund, and it pays for mostly 86% of that budget is teachers, is my staff. Some of it, there's um, light and heat, and those things makes up about another 10%, and there's about 6% of my budget is actually spent on supplies, paper, um, all of the other things that you see out in the building here. The majority of my budget is people. And so when we have to do something large, usually it comes from what we call VOG. Um, we've had an advantage lately with the um, multitude of federal funds coming in. We've made millions of dollars of upgrades into our HVAC systems because those are one of the things that um, with COVID was a, a very challenge for us. Um, the other thing we look at here is school capacities. What is our enrollment growth over time? What are the programmatic needs? Our high school runs Viking House. It's still teaching kids how to build and be in the construction trades. We now have a cabinet shop. So kids actually go in and learn the state of the art and how to produce um, cabinets. A state of the art welding shop. We have lots of these CTE programs. So we've got to kind of look at what, what are we trying to branch into? From all of that, a plan was created called the Long Range Facilities Plan. Last spring, we sat a bond development committee that takes that plan and begins to look at, so what are the things, because of there's um, three, $400 million worth of expenses over time. Well, you can't ever pay for that in one single bond. So you have to make choices about what things are you gonna add and what things are you not gonna add. Currently, um, this bond development committee went through, sat through and had, um, um, folks from all parts of the district that had retired folks, that had folks who were working, that had parents, that had folks who were not parents, trying to get a wide magnitude of folks. And in that, they developed a bond that was $121.9 million in investments. Um, it's about an addition of about $1.50 per thousand. And now I'm going to show you a little bit about what's in it. There's basically four categories of, of, of things that were um, trying to um, invest in here. The first is improved safety and security. Um, you've seen it, we've all seen it over the years, but specifically last spring with Uvalde, um, safety and security continues to be one of our highest priorities. All of our buildings are currently locked. There's, um, you, you don't get into a building without going through um, one of our locked doors. 
Today, we have the doors open because um, we didn't want folks to be buzzing, but there's basically a system we have at the doors where you buzz and then somebody on the um, inside sees who you are and then says, yes, you can come in. That happens in all of our buildings. One of the issues we have with security is we don't have line of sight. There's a couple of buildings that don't have line of sight, which is um, we need to be able to see anybody coming into a building, be able to see them from our front offices. So those, that looks, that's a concern for us. The other thing would be to make the glass at these entries tougher. Um, that can be investment in safety glass, or it can also be these films that you can put on it that make it so that when you shoot it out, it doesn't break away. Repair aging and um, update aging school buildings. This is a majority part of every bond because of this is the investment that we make as a community to make sure our buildings are still up and running and successful for years to come. When schools get used for like a hundred years. So when you build a school, I mean, people have to ask me, well, Fred Myers, they can pop up a building much cheaper and faster than people in schools. Well, there's a reason for that because our buildings have to last for a long time. So, so that also means that we have a lot of maintenance that we need to do on it. This would be the large pieces too, like roofs, new ventilation systems. Um, the other pieces of maintenance we always are out and doing, but these are kind of new systems. Third would be to expand learning student opportunities. In this bond, you'll see there's going to be um, some CTE opportunities for the high school. We're watching expansions into pre-K go into all of the buildings. So that's what those investments are. Last but not least would be in this bond would be to replace Cornelius Elementary. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I'm going to come back. So this is, um, we had a, a new study done on um, enrollments. Before we went into the pandemic, our enrollments were growing. And in the pandemic, we um, found out very quickly that those enrollments were changing. So we just had a new study done. And this is kind of the results of that new study. And the important thing to see here is, is that the um, first the lighter color is now, where our current enrollments are. The darker color is 10 years from now. And then last, this solid line here is our actual capacity inside of the building that we um, have. The dotted line is if we, some of our buildings, we've moved in mobile classrooms, so they're outside. Um, so what you'll notice is here, here is the 10-year estimate for our elementary schools is basically almost all of them will be basically at capacity. I mean, they're, they're not over capacity. This is um, actually not a, an uncommon place for us to be. The one that I want you to notice here is Cornelius Elementary School. Um, Cornelius Elementary School right now is over capacity. That's this piece right here. It's about uh, 70 or 80 kids over capacity. We currently have seven classrooms outside. And the problem in today's world with having classrooms outside is the security and the safety. We don't tend to build buildings. The other interesting thing about Cornelius is that there's more outside doors at Cornelius than we have at our high school. All that to me is an incredible um, thing for us. Um, so, a little out of order here, so it's a new presentation. we got to work on that a little bit. Um, Cornelius is our second oldest building. This building um, and Gales Creek, I think, are right in that same range, but this building doesn't, we don't need to do anything. This is um, where the administration lives. We're just fine. But Cornelius isn't. Um, overcrowded, significant security uh, concerns for the reasons that I just pointed out. Many of the building systems have reached their end of usable life. Um, and, you know, we walk some folks through there. There'll be some open houses that we do too, but for the basic gist of it is when it was built, it was, it was an excellent school. Where it's at right now, it's not. Last thing that I want to point out is Cornelius is home to some of our most at-risk students. And so for me, providing a resource for them to learn in that's excellent is a high priority. Um, this is the place where we actually have the most work that we need to do. 
Uh, safety and security, again, Cornelius is one of the big issues for us, just the number of outside doors. Um, we do have another school that has some similar worries for us, that's Harvey Clark. That's still, um, there's, it didn't rise to the same level of priority that Cornelius did, but that's still an issue for us that we're, we're thinking about and working on. Um, NAMS, we need a new um, entry. There's no line of sight from the main office to folks coming into the building. So they need to reconstruct that. In this bond is that new reconstruction so that that can be, they'll also create a, what they call a vestibule now where there's two sets of locked doors that you have to get through to get into the school. Um, upgrading the fire systems. Um, that's actually will happen across the district. And again, some of the issues we saw this summer with the um, chem shower pole and um, the fire systems and our alarm systems not alarming properly created the problem where it got worse. Um, we might've been able to stop that sooner had those systems work um, properly. Um, playground equipment and um, all of that across the district. Um, the aging school buildings, the, the, the big pieces here are new boilers, new electrical um, pieces. The um, plumbing, roofing, um, they'll be HVAC work. We've already invested millions of millions of federal dollars in improving um, HVAC, but this will actually go across the district with those pieces. There's still some surfaces we have, athletic surfaces, specifically Tom Call and NAMS, that this bond will go to um, fix. We have not only do we use them, but the community uses significantly uses them and they're um, degraded. And then general internal repairs and maintenance. Expanding the learning opportunities. We've got um, one of the big ones at the high school that this bond will pay for is we do not have a pre-K there anymore. And there used to be little Vikings and there was a pre-K. With the pre-K, it's not only giving that opportunity to those kids, but the other thing that happens there is we run an education pathway. One of the biggest challenges we have right now is getting teachers. And we should be building, like introducing kids into education from the time that they're sophomores and um, juniors in high school. And right now, without the little Vikings, there isn't a space to run the education pathway. So this bond will build two classrooms in the high school. Um, the, in the last bond, they already have these two classrooms kind of slated. They know where they're gonna go and the rest. And in it, will, you will put the new Viking pre-K and then we'll run the CTE pathway to train teachers. Um, this modernizes, um, some of you may have read the newspaper, we doubled the number of pre-K classrooms in our district from three to now six. Um, Pre-K is, is an extremely important aspect of helping to level the playing field for kids as they enter elementary school. So having more of these pre-Ks for folks who can't afford um, private pre-K is um, incredible. I would love to get to the place where we're saying pre-K pre for all. Um, that would level the playing fields for everybody, but we're not there yet. This bond though will take in each one of these schools ensure the, um, the, the classroom itself has to be different, smaller, um, everything's smaller, right? And none of our elementary classrooms are really built without those specifications in mind. This bond will build, um, kind of remodel a classroom in every one of our pre, um, elementary schools for pre-K. Um, PE stations, we don't currently at the middle school, we cannot meet the state requirements because we don't have enough PE spaces. This bond will fix NAMs to provide for another PE space. And then there's classroom instructional tech across the district. Um, things continue to move. And even with the pandemic, I mean, that was the nice thing about Forest Grove was we were already one-to-one. -one. So we didn't really have to work that hard to get tech out to um, our, our um, students. But tech is always changing. And so upgrading, um, I'll give you an example here. In many of our classrooms, they have smart boards. And there's a projector that shoots onto a smart board and they can touch that smart board and it would interact with the computer. The issue nowadays is that um, those projector bulbs are $300 a pop. And every single time you go through one of those, um, putting a 70 inch TV connected to an iPad now, the solution is not only, it only costs us once, um, 
but I don't have to buy bulbs. And for the teacher, it actually works better. And so as we're, as smart boards and projectors are going out, of, um, they're dying, we're actually starting to push back with new instructional tech to, it's cheaper, also more effective. Um, this bond will do that across our district. Next steps. So we're between here and November 8th, we'll be out talking to schools. We'll be out at different times. Why don't you come on up, Howard? Because this is um, Howard runs our political action committee. And so um, over the next six to eight weeks, we will be out um, talking to folks, educating, and I'm, well, I won't be advocating, but I'll be advocating. <laughs> A couple of things I just want to mention before I start. When I started at the high school in 97, um, the, the little kinder group was there, and it was really cool to see them when they walked in. And the, um, the students at Forest Grove High School had the opportunity. They met them at the front of the school, and they literally marched in. And they did all kinds of activities with them. And there were lots of students when they graduated that had done that, that went into the teaching profession. So I want to uh, reemphasize what uh, Dave said on that. Um, as I look around the room, okay, um, I see uh, many people that I know from when I had your children in school or when I coached your children playing softball or helped your child when they're running track or whatever. So I see a lot of people in the room. Um, I see a gentleman sitting in the back of the room that I, I will uh, single out. My first year teaching at Neil Armstrong in 1979, uh, Pete Van Dyke was a freshman. <laughs> and um, got the coach, got the coach in, in football. Go Titans, in back exactly. Um, and I also had Bob uh, Mr. Water Street's uh, oldest child at Neil Armstrong then. But it's important. It's important. I've taken a tour of Cornelius School. Uh, let me, let me, before I go there, the school district has done a great job, a fabulous job over the last 10 years when the last bond was in terms of spending public money. Um, when we were going through the process, one of the things we we were able to have up to date numbers that allowed us to look at what our needs really were, and those numbers had gotten they were they decreased, and so we were able to trim down the amount that we were going to ask. And there was another ask on here for um, another building. And um, it would have it was this, the school district was really really understanding that you know tax dollars are tax dollars um, and trying to keep that dollar out of the amount and they were able to utilize bond money from 2012 to refurbish the school out of Taylor Annex that there's now uh, eight classrooms out there for students that are at the alternative setting. When I subbed there in 2013, there were two and a half classrooms. And you couldn't maneuver in the school at the same time. Now they have an elevator, they have a stairwell, they have a kitchen, um, and they have the opportunity with buses to go back to the high school for electives, which is really, really important. It's really, really important in today's society that children that might be a little bit different. I was different, okay, when I was in school, okay? You want to have the opportunity for, uh, uh, let me say it this way. When I, was, when I taught 10th grade at the high school, there was no honors class. So I had a gentleman in class who was, he's right now, he's a uh, doctor at MIT, teaches at MIT, okay? As well as a person who had no understanding of what Western civilization was. Those were the two extremes. And, I, and when the gentleman who's at MIT graduated, he told me, he said, he goes, Mr. Sullivan, thank you for allowing me to be in a class with other students that were maybe not my caliber, but he goes, I sure did learn from them. It showed me how that you need to treat other people. So I think one of the things the school district is going to do is with their alternative site, and they saved this money. 
they utilized some of the money from the 2012 bond. They spent $500,000 to create a space. If you get a chance, they will take you on a tour of it. Yeah. Okay, but we need three things from you. We need volunteers. We need volunteers. So if anybody wants to volunteer to help with the, the bond, okay. We need businesses to put a sign in their business. It says, yes, for our kids. Notice we don't use the name Forest Grove. We don't use the name um, Cornelius. It's yes for our kids. And we need dollar. We need you to vote yes. I'm looking out there. I know we as a Rotary Group support education at Fort Grove High School. Sharon's not here. You want a scholarship, did you? Okay. Um, so we support public education in that regard. So I'm just making my reach. If you want to sign up, Mr. Warren will take names. If you want to volunteer, we have phone banks coming up, text messaging, etc. cetera. Um, but I will say, I will finish with this. The Fort Grove School District has done a good job over the last 20 years in utilizing bond money. And I sit and look at two gentlemen, Mr. Showerman, Mr. Heisler, that were huge, huge proponents when we put the stadium in at the high school. So I just want to uh, point that out. Thank you for your um, service there. Any questions? questions? Mark? First of all, is this a replacement? So it is not uh, during the pandemic. It is not a replacement bond. Um, it fell during the pandemic. The I forget which year it was, but it was in the 2000s when you passed the bond. That fell off like 2019, right during. It was right during the pandemic. No, it would have been 20. Um, and at that time, we just didn't have the bandwidth to run this process to do that so it's so your your tax rate actually went down this year um from where it was this would be increasing but yeah that's yes and then question number two Can I say a question there cornelius for some of us the gym and the lunchroom are new yeah Will that stay or will that... so the conversation that we're having with the city there it, it's it's in a great spot it's uh, a good gym it's a big gym and the cafeteria space there so one of the things that we started i started this conversation with rob drake is there may be a way for us to utilize those spaces still as a community space um you're right those two are newer we don't need to tear all of that down the plan would be to um build in the back part of the um, field while we're still using the school out front and then to tear down the school out front when we start using the space in back. Yeah, Tim. So the issue you have with security, and I'm thinking back to my high school days, I counted there's, there were 15 or 20 doors. And at one end you had tennis strips, and at the other end you had a softball field. And you have the buses coming. How do you keep all those doors locked and still function? So the it's it's a great question because of the weakest part of security is the human element. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, so all of those doors are locked. Um, teachers or kids can put a rock in it so that it doesn't close. Currently, our software will um, notify folks. Well, it will as soon as we finish programming it because after last summer, this became an issue for us. Um, but we, actually part of the alarm system will notify us the door stays open for 15 minutes or some amount of time. And then an uh, administrator will get a text and they'll just sit back by and close the door. It's kind of what the plan is. Can the kids still in and out on all those doors or are they locked to them? Um, some are, there's some major entry doors that they can get out, other doors might be locked. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what uh, what is being done about seismic retrofitting yeah. and preparation for what we know is going to happen here within the next hundred years, sir? Yeah. So the buildings that are currently being built, like Joe Gale is in the North building, those are all built with the seismic code already built into them. Other ones we're um, working on. Tom McCall, like two or three years ago, we did a seismic upgrade to. It's also parts of it are new work. Um, but Cornelius is a great example because there's about $4 million worth of, um, if we don't, 
build a new one, you're still going to spend money. Um, and so there's about $4 million worth of upgrades we're going to have to do, plus the seismic on top of that. So again, if we build it, then I can spend that money in other places. Um, but we're moving through and improving buildings. Like HVAC and some of these other large systems, though, these, these costs are um, staggering. Um, so, so I was planning principal. I built um, well, Century High School, and I was part of the planning committee, and then I built South Meadows. Um, I was the planning principal for there. We spent $31 million in 2010 to build that middle school in Hillsboro. Current estimate is $125 million to do that same school now. So the, the costs here continue to go up and you might think to yourself, well, we just won't build. The problem is, is that next year it's gonna cost more. So the, um, the key here is to do what, we're, what we do, which is there's a hundred year plan here and you keep investing over time so that you don't get into a place where you have to replace two schools at once or three schools. Um, part of what happened with Portland Public is that situation, is they had to all of a sudden replace four or five of their 50 schools. That's where you get into some real um, problems. Uh, you mentioned the print marketing materials. Are those ready and available yet? Yes. We're we are rapidly doing that. We're, we'll be out of cornrows on Saturday, and so those are starting to come out. Um, signs and those kind of things, we can get that to you. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear we got it down to a dollar number that's feasible. It's really imperative to actually take care of Cornelius Grade School. Um, my, I have two questions, really. One is, how far into planning are you in, in our, and how much the planning with the ODOT? Because you're gonna, that's already a congested area when the buses and everybody has to bring their child to school in the morning. It's impossible to get Dutch and get to the office. <laughs> so, <laughs> so can you, can you address the, 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 the road and how you're gonna get in and out? Yeah. When you're going to put spade and dirt and get that going. Yeah. So what I will tell you is, is that we will have to go through the, the school picture that we put up about Cornelius Elementary. It's very diffuse. And there's a reason for that is we actually have to go through a process and we'll bring in the community and we'll bring in staff and we'll go through a design process. So we're not very far on like what this is going to look like and the, the rest of that. That still is a process then we'll start after we actually pass. Oops. <laughs> Oops. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we didn't hear that. Exactly. Um, but that's, we'll start on that process. And so we'll have to go through with the city. We'll have to work through all of those different pieces. I will also tell you, though, as a, as a educator for 32 years, every school, 12 minutes after, um, it ends, it's going to be a nightmare around the school. That's like, it doesn't matter which school you're at, it's always 12 minutes after the final bell is going to be a mess. So, yeah. I'm curious, have you already nailed all the security issues? Uh, it seems to me, I've watched a lot of crime shows lately. Uh, the police have CCTV cameras that can pick anybody up. Have, have you given any thought? Yeah, so that, that's actually part of this package. So um, our CCTV has come together over time, and the difference is now in the technology, specifically the cameras and the acuity with which the cameras can pick up are completely different than they were even 10 years ago. And some of our stuff is from earlier. So a lot of this will be replacing some of the older analog material with better cameras and some of it will be new and additional. We've already put up, I wanna say close to 20 new cameras this year, just beginning to react to security issues that we're having. So it's an ongoing um, issue for us. I, you brought up preschool. So um, maybe Dr. because I used to work for Washington County, Head Start program. Yeah. And do they not come out here to Forest Grove? 
No, we have to make it just a space for them to be in their schools at first grade. So we also have Head Start. Head Start is still running. Our pre K is right now. Our schools, the six that we have, it's funded completely separate from my regular general fund called Preschool Promise. And it's basically right now it's all laid out for lower income um, folks. And there's a specific marker that you have to be at. It runs, it's a full day pre K. So it runs from early in the morning till late. There's also um, champions afterwards. So it's just a little bit different. And the planning on pre-K um, across, specifically in our uh, county, because there's been a lot of work around how do we begin to do something with this? But it's to, um, all the planning's been not to replace somebody else's job, but how do we augment and give parents choice? And so there'll still be independent daycares running and having these students and um, some in the planning, if it was funded either through the county or through the state, folks would get paid, would get, um, there would be a, just like I get paid for the number of students I have in my school district. But the idea here would be not to replace, but to put in different kinds. Um, language is a great example. Um, there's not very many um, dual language pre case And so most of the um, Spanish or, uh, or um, all my languages are leaving other languages most of those are in private daycares. And so we don't want to get rid of those who actually want to augment and um, get them. So that's kind of what ours is really headed right now for low income full day. I'm going to rough. I'm going to get better. Um, but I do appreciate um, the, the, the feedback and the interaction. Like I said, for um, this is going to be an important piece for our for our students, and there's a lot of great work that we can do here. So we will get information to you on how you can interact with us. And again, I want to thank everybody for coming and spending some time with us. <laughs>